sometimes words put together in a certain fashion in the same way colors on a, on a canvas just do something they spark something in the soul and in the psyche eugene peterson said the pastor and the poet have the same mandate to speak into the chaos the profile you're listening to premier christian radio Hello and welcome to The Profile here on Premier Christian Radio with me, Sam Hales. I am the editor of Premier Christianity magazine. That's the UK's leading Christian publication. If you'd like a free sample copy, just head over to our website right now at premierchristianity.com forward slash free sample and we will give you a free copy of the new issue of the magazine. We've got Sir Cliff Richard on the front cover. Fantastic interview with him this month. Um, Some really moving pieces as well. Simon Ponsonby has been writing on the shocking Christian roots of the Holocaust. We've also got a really moving piece from a couple who tragically lost their toddler and they explain how their faith survived that ordeal. So some really hard-hitting pieces in the January edition of Premier Christianity that is out right now. Get your free sample copy at Premier Christianity com forward slash free sample. Today, my guest on the profile is Joshua Luke Smith. I'm going to let Joshua introduce himself for you. It's one of the first questions that I ask him in this interview. Really, really enjoyed this conversation. I hope you do too. So without any further ado, I'm going to play in the conversation I had with Joshua Luke Smith. Hope you enjoy. Well, I'm joined now by Joshua Luke Smith. Joshua, welcome to the show. Thank you, brother. I appreciate it. It's good to be here. My first question is very simple. Who is Joshua Luke Smith? Oh, your, your, your first question is existential. It's not <laughs> simple. <laughs> um, so I am, um, well, I can now say I'm a, I'm a husband and I'm a father. Um, similar to you, say I'm a husband and a father and a poet and a follower of Jesus. I live in Bath and I uh, spend most of my time either with people. Um, I love people. I love helping people or making music, writing poems. That's kind of my world. There you go. I have to say yeah. your world encompasses so much now. As you say, spoken mm. word, artistry, you're a podcaster, you're part of a community. Um, mm-hmm. So take us right back to the beginning, though. We always like to go back to the beginning and hear about a person's early life. So tell me a little bit about where you grew up and what were the sorts of values, I guess, that formed you from an early age? Oh, good question. Um, so born in Croydon and then my parents moved us out to Pakistan where uh, my dad did various things, but one of them was setting up a hospital in the northern area of Pakistan, a place called Gilgit, quite near the Afghan Afghan border. Yeah. And um, so my formative years were spent on the dusty roads of northern Pakistan, surrounded by the Himalayas. And that was all I knew. That was that was life. I, we came back in 98 and um, it was the 98 World Cup. And I just have this like very clear memory of not knowing who David Beckham was in the in in the playground and realizing that I lived in a whole different world but that different world was like my norm and to be honest I don't think I've ever really fully adjusted back in the sense I've always felt nomadic I've always felt slightly slightly on the outside not in a not a negative way but just you know I've never spent much time in one place um, and I think I think that that was built in me from the beginning of the kind of my parents were missionaries. And I've, I've always connected with that, that approach to life of like, we're on mission, you know, we're, we're here one day, and then we're, we're there the next day. And, um, and that's something that that's true now in my adult life as much as it was as a child. So what was it that took your whole family to Pakistan? I was not expecting that when you said you grew up in Croydon. And then suddenly next thing I know, whoa, you're in <laughs> yeah. Pakistan. that's quite the jump. Yeah, no, it was it was um it was a love of people and a desire to see people healed. My dad wanted to he did he did very a very basic eye surgery on people that prevented them from being blind, but you know it was simple because you know how to do it, but many people were blind and as a result was just able able to share about Jesus with them and and um yeah, just a love for people and wanting a desire to be with people in their brokenness and in their poverty. And so my sisters and I witnessed things that we would never have witnessed had we grown up here or had we stayed in London, you know, poverty and pain um, and also beauty and community in ways that we don't see here in the West in, in, in the same way. Yeah. So tell me a bit about how your faith developed and changed over time. Obviously a very strong Christian background to have your parents as missionaries, mm. but at what point did faith, I guess, become your own? Great question. Um it was, you know, it was probably later on in my in my sort of teens that I 
I, I use this word like integrated a lot where I think there were, there's often things in our sort of peripheral vision that are there and they're slowly becoming more integrated into our whole self, which is still ongoing, obviously, for all of us. But Jesus, the man Jesus and the way of Jesus, what it means to follow Jesus became something I was more intrigued by later on in, in later on in my teenage years. And what I realized was, oh, so what mom and dad did, that was because of Jesus. That wasn't just because of a humanitarian kind of desire. That was because of Jesus. Um, and this curiosity around Jesus has never left me. Like right now, I don't know if you've thought about this, but just like seeing my daughter, I'm thinking, all right, well, now it begins again. The cycle of, you know, passing on these stories and passing on this faith. And I'm, I'm constantly thinking it through of like, who is Jesus and who is he to me today? And my faith, I, I, I've been using this line, Sam, recently of, um, I want to be a merchant of mystery. You know, I want to I want to get in the boat and I want to go into the deep waters. I want to seek out mystery. It's, it's the scriptures tell us that God is the glory of God to conceal a matter for it's the glory of men to search it out. That's that's what roots me in faith is. It's, it's an opportunity to embrace mystery. And so I'm trying to, I'm trying to be as, as least kind of certain about things that are meant to be open um, and just following, following the way every day that I can, you know. <laughs> this might say more about me than you, but uh, I have to say in, in having, having a daughter, there's, there's definitely part of my brain that thinks, Sam, you really should have figured out more stuff in life before you had a kid. Like, <laughs> oh, no, for sure. You know, but going back to what you said about mystery, you think actually maybe maybe there's a case for that in saying actually as Christians, you know, we don't have all the answers to all these things, but but there's there's some huge things I've not figured out yet. And you think I've got oh, to man. start teaching the little that I do know to someone else. You right. Know? Yeah, absolutely. No, it's true. I, I, I think about Jesus saying, you know, bring me the children, you know, bring me the children. You must become like a child. So. I, I'm saying to my daughter now, like, what do you see, babes? Like, what what are you hearing? You know, because I'm like, oh dang, she's the she's gonna be the teacher, isn't she? That's how this is gonna work out. Yeah, <laughs> amazing. So, at what point as a teenager did you start to, I guess, kind of fall in love with music and some of the spoken word stuff that you you've done more recently? You know, was that was that there as a teenager? Was music your thing from quite an early age? Yeah, massively. I wrote I wrote my first poem at nine. Um, struggled with school dyslexic, I, I, I call it the triple threat, dyslexic, ADHD, and dyspraxia. So school was rough just in terms of the lessons. I just didn't connect. But I just started writing poems, man. Nine years old, sat in class writing poems, even if it was maths. Went to secondary school. Found it very difficult in terms of engaging in the classroom. But my parents built out this little studio space in our spare room. And I'd just come home from school every day and I'd just start making beats and start writing. I just... I just never stopped writing. I started writing at nine years old. I've never stopped writing. I've, I'm just, I love it. I, I can't, it's, 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 it sounds so cliche, but it's like breathing. It's just something I'm constantly doing, you know, putting words together. So, um, but, but throughout my teenage years, I fell, I fell in love with hip hop. I discovered hip hop um, and I discovered Eminem. I discovered the Fugees, Nas, some UK hip hop, Skinny Man. And that was it, man. That was game over. That was, I was all in, you know. Amazing. Well, why don't we hear some of it? Um, as you say, you've written so much. I'm going to leave yeah. it to you, but it would be great right. to hear um, some of what you've been working on and um, and hear what you've been talking about, kind of put into action. So over to you. Yeah, for sure. All right. Well, I'll give you um, I'll give you a snippet. This will, this will be a short one. We could do something longer after. But this is um, this is from a piece I'm writing at the moment. And I, I think it's going to be called The Defiant Ones. And uh, effectively, it's it's about this this moment that we're in and the complexity and the perplexion of it. Um, So, life used to look so beautiful. And then you lose someone you love and it starts to look unusual. Picasso paintings with abstract faces, I'm trying to place it. God, give me the courage to face the pain and pick flowers in a wasteland. And if you're on the other end of this, I pray that you remember this. Hope is real and you were meant for it. And I swear you got the strength for it. And that's all that our friendship is. Walking through this hell on earth, bringing heaven where the devil lives. We're on the wrong side of the tracks, man, I know that. But we're taking pictures of our pain with a Kodak. And now I look closer at the image and I see that you ain't finished. Now you were dancing through the struggle, thanking God for all all that you've been given. And so now I thank you for just living because you showed us that these prisons are made of what we give them and we ain't bound to no one's system. We are free. And ain't that something to believe? We are free. Amazing. 
Thank you, you so go. much for sharing. <laughs> all good, bro. All good. It strikes me that there's an amazing talent in not just in delivering it, but actually in remembering it. <laughs> Again, this probably says more <laughs> about me, but my memory, I couldn't, I couldn't hold that in my head. And and it's it's not like that's just one poem. As you say, you've probably got, I don't know, probably hundreds up there, right? Of of stuff <laughs> that you could just pretty much off the cuff. Which is is remarkable, I think, especially given what you you talked about the triple threat earlier in school and finding school difficult because of some of the um, dyslexia. But but in terms of the memory, I mean, that's incredible recall, isn't it? Is that something that's just innate to you? You've always had a memory and a, and a kind of sense for these things. You know, just just in this area, I've never um, written any of my poems down uh, whilst writing them. So I find writing very difficult, um, and if I start writing on a page the words begin getting jumbled. So I write in my head and right. then at a later time, I'll start writing it down. Um, so I'm, I'm curious about it because I, I would, I, I'd love to see the neurology on it of like, I don't know how I remember it, but I know a lot of people work in the same way that if you had asked me to tell you a poem from six years ago, I could, it's just there. It's in wow. the filing cabinet. Um, and part of it is through the methodology of writing that I'm, as I'm writing it, I'm remembering it as I'm writing, I'm reciting. So it's kind of getting logged in there. Um, I remember my dad in GCSE is just saying, Josh, just write your revision notes as poems. So I remember writing this poem. On, I can't remember this one, but I wrote a poem about photosynthesis. Wow. I remember recalling it in my GCSEs. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I'd be interested from a, like a brain perspective of how that how that works. because I, I don't understand it because I can't remember the shopping list. You know, I can't remember <laughs> the five things I got to the shop to get. <laughs> when it comes to poetry and, and spoken word you spoke about some of your influences but I, i'd love to know kind of what motivates you to, to mm. do this i've spoken to different christian artists down the years you know s- some christians will say really the, the music is just there as a vehicle for the message and for me the message is really important and i know some christians are, are very evangelistic and when they perform and it's it's all about giving people the gospel i also know christians who who don't really feel called to that at all and to them it is just about making good art You've got missionary parents, so I'd love to know where you fall on that kind of a scale. Uh, uh, to what extent is it I've got a message to give, and to what extent is it not really interested in the message? I just want to make good art. Oh, uh, such a good question. I, I don't, I don't really have a straight answer for it. I'm probably somewhere in the middle. I don't think music is a means to an end. I think music is an end within itself. I think, I think it is. I think, I think art, art enables us to truly make sense of our experiences, and sometimes, I think sometimes my creations are there more for the untangling than they are for and now here's like a message or something that you've got to go away with um i think that's the beauty of poetry is helping us untangle so sometimes um i i might say something that that is quite abstract and and what i'll be running down my mind is like but what does someone take away from that well that's not really the point sometimes words put together in a certain fashion in the same way colors on a, on a canvas just do something they spark something in the soul and in the psyche and and i i just think that's valid in itself so it's a really good question i think ultimately you eugene peterson said the pastor and the poet have the same mandate to speak into the chaos and i love that and that's, that's a line that i've really held on to to speak into the chaos um, that's how everything began. Like the Genesis story tells us that God spoke into the chaos and life was birthed. So I feel like my work is is two things is being in chaos, which sounds bizarre, but it, it is it is seeking out places of chaos to not run away from chaos is externally in society, but also in myself to, to, to go on the inner journey to and and, so, and sometimes it's just a case of speaking about that like it sucks. Right. Or just just talking about the entanglement and then sometimes it's about untangling that which feels like it's caught us or restricted us so i don't know if that makes any sense to you bro but (laughs) it's somewhere in the middle like i don't have i don't have the mandate of you know i'm an evangelist and with my music like there's an altar call at the end that's not how i approach it um but i I definitely know there's a message in it for sure What you said there reminds me actually of, of something Rob Bell wrote recently. I know you've, you've, you've worked with him, collaborated with him. We'll, we'll talk about that in a moment. But actually in his, in his latest book, he tells this story of being a preacher and he'd give a sermon on a particular topic, but then people would come up to him afterwards and they'd say how encouraging and how meaningful that sermon was about something in their life to do with their marriage or do with their kids. And, and Rob Bell would think, but I wasn't preaching on that. I said nothing about that. And yet yeah. somehow, and obviously I think Rob Bell uses slightly different language to the language I'd use because personally mm-hmm. I would say, well, that's the Holy Spirit taking the message mm-hmm. and applying it 
impact someone's life. But I think it speaks right. to exactly what you just said about two people can hear the same piece of music and yes. actually have very different effect on them, but both very yes. positive effects. And, and even what you write may have yeah. nothing to do with that person's situation. <laughs> and yet somehow yeah. something good is taken from it. There's, there's, there mm. is, a, again, to come back to that word we've used already, there is a mystery to it, isn't there? There really is, you know. I don't know if you've ever read any Henry Nowen, um, but his book on the prodigal prodigal son. It, the whole book is based upon him staring at um, Rembrandt, one of Rembrandt's paintings. That you might have seen the painting of the prodigal son. The whole book is just him looking at this painting and taking his own reflection of it. And the book, and uh, to, to, to quote Rob Bell, uh, as you brought him up, you know, the, the I, but you know what, actually, I think this is this is this is originally Henry Now. I think this is Henry Now. By the way, Rob Bell is the particular is hidden in the universal as the universal is in the particular. So, you know, there's there's this universal like appreciation for something, but then there's a particular you know expression of it for you, um, and that's at the heart of the the scriptures. The word, the what's the the word became flesh. So, there is this like enfleshment, this incarnation with everything that we do in as an artist i really i really do believe that so i'll put something out that might feel like it's very universal but when you digest it it becomes very particular it, what a yeah. joy man what a joy to be able to do that yeah that's a good way of putting it so yeah so so i brought him up i should put the question back to you you uh, recently worked with him i think you interviewed him so the roles were reversed slightly you were interviewing rob were you uh, so tell me a bit yeah. about your your work with him how you met and um and yeah what that looks like yeah, no, so it was, uh, I turned 30 this year and my wife and a bunch of friends paid for me to go out and do a, do a couple day retreat with him and a few others. Um, so I spent two days in LA just, just sitting at his feet, man, just hearing him speak and asking him a ton of questions. And uh, it, it, was, it was a phenomenal time. I mean, I don't know about you, I, I grew up with, with Numa and all that, all that stuff. So and I've always appreciated his work. And so I did that and then came back home. I was out for a run. I thought, you know what, I want to I want to ask Rob if I can interview him, um, if I can go on his podcast and interview him. And so I wrote to his team. And then like 10 minutes later, I got an email back from him. He was like, let's do this. Then I, I had flights booked to go out to L.A. and do it. And, you know, obviously COVID happened. Ah. So when I saw that his book was coming out, I said, you know, let's do the podcast in the flesh. But how about we have a conversation about your book? And he was like, yeah, let's do it. So we, we've gone back and forth a few times and he's been a, he's been a, a huge inspiration to me um, on a number of levels. And I really I really appreciate the time that he's given me and the, the space that we've had just to dialogue and publicly and privately just have some good, really good conversations. Some people will uh, will criticize me for doing this, but for me, I can't talk about Rob Bell and then not immediately ask a question more broadly about theology uh, because he's been, he's been so uh, controversial in, in more recent years and we don't need to go mm -hmm. over all of that. Um, and at the end of the day, you can work with whoever. It doesn't mean you endorse everything they stand for. Of mm -hmm. course not. At right. the same time, where do you find yourself now in terms of church and theology? Um, you know, what does local church look like for you? Um, yeah. and, and where do you find yourself? And again, it'd be in really interesting to hear if, if that's sort of changed over time in any way or you've kind of grown or matured or left things behind or taken things on in your spiritual journey so just tell me just mm. give us a little bit of a snapshot of where you're at with, yeah. with church these days great questions man I, lo I, lo I love good questions sam so i pre appreciate your questions um yeah no my wife and i've been involved in helping lead a local church we we're part of a church called life church bar um it was originally bar city church and if anyone knows it i mean it's, it's at one time it was quite a well-known church charismatic evangelical um, and so we've been a part of leading that church and we still are, we're part of the elders, the leadership team there, which is an honor. And I believe in the local church. I believe in the gathering of, of people and the community that it creates. Um, my faith is evolving, you know, like, like all of us. And, and, uh, there's a lot of the kind of the tradition or the tribe I grew up in, which would be traditionally kind of evangelical that I wouldn't, I wouldn't relate to in the same way, you know, like there's there's nothing about the expression i've been in that i want to burn down you know like um I, i'm not here to burn anything i want to build but there also comes a time i think there's there's eight there's an abrahamic sort of ideal in all of us where we leave the gods of our fathers and we go in search of this city which the builder and architect is god it's just it's just what happens we're on pilgrimage you know i'm fascinated by this idea of pilgrimage because for a pilgrim, the work is never done. You're constantly moving and constantly evolving. And so, I mean, we could get into the theology, but there's there's specific, you know, theology that 
you know, if I sit around the dinner table with my family now, it's like, yeah, we don't, we don't believe the same thing anymore. Um, and that's all good. And, and, and we all know that we all believe things that the church has historically embraced at different times in different ways. So, you know, even, even the things that people have found most controver controversial about Rob Bell, it's just because it's the first time they're hearing it, you know, in their context, evangelical, rather than going, you know, 500 years back and seeing when it was first written and it's been around for a long time. And hey, I've really, I've really appreciated your platform, Sam, and Premier as, as a platform for just hosting conversations that 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 recognize to be a follower of Jesus isn't to subscribe to just one way of seeing the world or the scriptures. Um, I've loved it, the voice yeah. that you that your platform has given to people. And you yourself, Sam, I've actually seen it in like in your tweeting, you know, the way that you'll you'll happily hold space. I, I see it's evident in, in you. I hold, hold space for different views and stuff. So yeah, I, I wouldn't describe myself in the way, I wouldn't describe myself as, you know, charismatic evangelical in the way that I would have done once. But sure. there's, no, yeah. there's nothing of that world that I, that I seek to burn yeah. down, you know? Like, yeah, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I think that's very helpful. I, I, I know both of us can think of examples of people who have left that particular word or label and, yeah. uh, and as you point out, you know, have actually got quite angry and bitter about it, which mm. is understandable. But I think you're absolutely right. You can't stay in that place. It's not a healthy place to no. stay in. Um, and uh, thank you for the kind words. I've often said if um, if Premier Christianity magazine was just my points of view, or I've often said, you know, there's stuff in the magazine I don't agree with and I, I publish right. the magazine. But I said yeah. if it was just my point of view, it would be incredibly boring. And we'd have to we have to <laughs> rebrand it Premier Sam Hales magazine. And, uh, right, right. and that would only have an audience of me, which would be, you know, <laughs> <laughs> wouldn't be very good for our bottom line really would it yeah um, so yeah we're all about trying to trying to open up the conversation and i think that the thing for me is just and obviously we all draw the line in a different place right i mean totally, i would, I would totally. draw the line and say actually i couldn't i couldn't publish that actually you know if someone pitched yeah. an article saying i really want to talk about how um you know uh, allah is god and he only has one prophet called muhammad I said, i'm really sorry we're not the magazine for you <laughs> yeah. um, but but at the same time you think um you know my hope is on a host of other issues we can say there are good christians who hold different views to you you know on politics yes, on some sure. ethical issues for sure and it's really about opening opening up that conversation and could, could i just speak to that just um before we move on my wife and i will be talking ab about this uh, i won't go into it but you know around the around the u.s elections and and just seeing what's happened across the pond in terms of you know the politics and the faith and all, all that stuff is very different over here, but we're observers, right? We're looking at what's going on. And she said to me, how, how do you, how do you kind of walk the tension of seeing something that you don't agree with, but not becoming cynical about it? And we had this great conversation, you know, this word deconstruction, which is just, it's just such a huge part of how we talk about faith at the moment, especially in our generation deconstruction. I've never connected with that word, but as I said earlier, the, the word that really connects with me is integration. So the reason that one might, have, have, have find something problematic about a political stance um, combined with a faith stance is that the two don't seem integrated on whatever side of the aisle you're looking at it. Yeah. Um, and so I think a lot of the time, what we're trying to do is integrate our faith so that our sociology, our anthropology, our theology arrives all at the feet of Christ. And we're like, yeah. ah, this all comes together here rather than, you know, have this view of the scriptures, but it just doesn't reconcile with this view of, my society at large yeah. and the way of Jesus infiltrates and integrates into every part of our lives, which means we have to, as followers of him, have the humility to say, you know what, I might have to lay down my political sociological stance, you know, for my, for my, for my integrity in following him. And that's why even chatting with people I've said recently, do you know what, bro, I don't think you're deconstructing as much as you think you are. I think you're just trying to find a, pl a place of marrying two different tensions um i don't know if that makes sense again but that's that's yeah. pretty how i'd see it yeah absolutely i i've often looked looked over to america and thought you know it looks like christians are being presented with a choice if you have to go all in over here or all right. in over there and i look at it i think well there's there's things on on that side of the aisle that i think jesus stands for and some mm. things i think he doesn't stand for and on the mm. other side of the aisle it's exactly the same and i think right. i think for whatever reason british christians in, and this is a massive generalization but i think british christians have understood that for a long time right it's, it's mm -hmm. pretty unusual to find a christian in the uk who says as a christian i can only ever vote for this party that's pretty right. unusual Absolutely, whereas in america yeah. as you say that that is kind of the norm now 
Yeah, yeah, no, for sure. I think, I mean, I think there's a there's a lot in the history of Empire, right? I've, we've just been, Karen and I have been watching The Crown. I don't know if you guys watch The Crown, but yes. I'm loving it, man, because I'm like, <laughs> I'm learning my history, you know, as an Englishman. And I, we, we are a nation that had an empire and now doesn't, you know? And what comes with that, I think, is both a humility. You can also have like a false sense of humility, but a, a humility of like, oh, so we were great and then we won and we realized actually our greatness came at the cost of a lot of other people. And so you, you kind of become less, I don't know, less married to like the political image of your, your nation because you know what it can do at its best is actually sometimes its worst expression. And I think what we're seeing in America is an empire, right? And we're seeing the Christians in, in, that, in that country trying to tussle and work out what it means to be a part of, one of the most powerful nations on the planet. And what does that look like for my spirituality? And yeah, it's, it's, it's fascinating. It fascinating. Sure is. Absolutely. Well, um, bring it back a, uh, to a bit of your story. I'd love to hear um, a story of how you met your wife. Uh, mate. Well, do you know what? It's 18 years old uh, gap year in Toronto. Uh, wow. went, to, went, went to, went to a little Bible school and uh, bro, first day walked in and saw this beautiful, beautiful girl with, with dreadlocks. And um she's she's her story is that i stalked her my story <laughs> is that i was just you know curious um but i heard her singing i heard it she was sat in the lounge of this like bible college we were in and she was just singing and she got the most beautiful voice and i sat outside the door just listening to her sing and then my next move was i i had written a song that i hadn't written yet but i said i've written a song i love you to sing on it so then i went away and wrote a song and got her to sing on it and yeah man Five months later, we were going out, did the long distance thing. And uh, last week, as of last week, married nine years, man. Wow. Congratulations. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I was talking to a friend of mine who's um, who's a Christian and is, is dating. And she said on pretty much every Christian dating website, pretty much every Christian guy plays the guitar. <laughs> yes, we do. Yeah. <laughs> Which really made me laugh. But I think that's, that's a good King way. David route. Yes, it's a good good way to go. Absolutely. So, so I guess right from the beginning of your relationship, music music was right there, and you've kind of yeah. gone on in that vein, haven't you? In terms of working, yeah. collaborating together. So, tell me a bit about what you've gone Absolutely. on to do. Yeah, we've always music's always been a big part of our life, and in our first year of marriage, we we just decided it was going to be something that we did forever. So we set we had a, we had a mezzanine like one room apartment. The, the 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 bedroom was on the mezzanine. It was all in one room, but we used the downstairs and set up a little little studio and we started recording music and started recording music of various friends of ours and and that turned into what is now called Orphan No More, which is a creative community of of friends who get together to make art and um. Karen and I have been involved in that and leading it for for our entire marriage and it's one of the joys of our life. It's just it's one of those things that you just you get to pinch yourself that you that you get to be a part of it mm. um yeah. and and yeah we, we we love it and so Kara writes her own music Kara writes for all for no more we're, we're, we're individual artists but we come down together as a collective that has this has a worship expression to it and so Kara will write and sing on that as well it's a lot of fun a lot of fun yeah so and you've got a brand new album out haven't you so tell us a little bit yes. about the album yeah, yeah 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 we dropped the album in october it's called even now and uh, it's a collection of songs from the last couple of years that really all find themselves coming together around this moment of um, of, of tragedy. Basically, we, one of the one of the first people that got involved in Orphan No More was our friend Esther. Will and Esther were our best friends for a long time, and Esther, at 26, was diagnosed with breast cancer. She'd just become a mom, and you know, it was just three years of just. Um, walking with them as close as you can walk with another human being you know um just together in it and and tragically esther passed away at 28 so to 2018 she passed away and um the night that she passed away Karen and i we were praying through the night just praying praying for this for healing we, we knew it was the end um and we just started singing this phrase um even now even now we believe and it just out of out of the, the gospel of john jesus outside the grave of lazarus when when martha says to him but say the words and even now you know he will rise and just captured enamored by this story jesus announces himself as the resurrection and the life previously to that happen and he knows lazarus is going to be resurrected and yet he still weeps and he still stays and oof, I, yeah I, I get i get emotional talking about it right even now i'm just like ooh. um yeah and so this whole album has come out of that time of grief and also looking to this 
this coming resurrection, you know, this day where all things are made well. Esther had Esther quoted the phrase of Julian of Norwich. That's her like mantra, all shall be well, yeah. all shall be well, and all manner of things shall be well. Yeah. And when we say that, you know, we are we're speaking of a day that's to come, aren't we? We're speaking mm-hmm. of this eternal feast, this eternal moment of reconciliation. And so this album is capturing those two, those, those two experiences of the human, you know, existence, the tragedy and the hope. Um, we released it this last month, and now we're we're writing and looking at the next record that's coming out next year. Wow. Yeah, as you say, um, qu- quite a story about, about mm. Esther. And mm. um, she released her own music as well, didn't she? Including she did. Including yeah. that song, All, All Should Be Well, which yeah. uh, I, can hear, I, I can hear I can hear it playing in my head as we're talking. And yeah. I've, I've not listened to that song in years, but, yeah. but it was so beautifully written. I can recall the melody exactly. Right. Well, I'm just rem- I'm just remembering now that we actually met through a connection with Esther and, and they're working in Israel, right? Yeah, yeah, that's uh, right. So I, yeah. I think uh, there's a connection there as well. Yeah, just a, a phenomenal, remarkable woman as as a as a husband, Will, who's who's an amazing man, and their little boy Levy, they're they're, they're doing really well. I was going to say how so how are they getting on? Are you still close with them yeah. in touch? And... Oh, they live they live up the road, and right. we yeah yeah. Will Will's Will's my best friend. We, 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 yeah, we're, it's it's kind of a, a bond for life, and yeah, that he's doing really well, and Levy is Levy is wonderful. So yeah, it's 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 one of those stories that you just you know you, you. I hope this is encouragement to anyone going through anything like it, but it's you you when you you just can't see the light at the end of the tunnel, and that's just okay but it doesn't mean that it isn't there. And that at some point, somehow, somewhere, you'll look and you'll say, wow, even now he's making all things new. You know, there's that scene in the Passion of the Christ where, uh, I don't know if you remember, he's, Jesus is walking with the cross. And I don't believe this is from the scriptures. You'll be able to tell me, Sam, but I think it's Mel Gibson kind of riffing, but he's, you know, he's walking with the cross and he looks over, he's stumbling, he looks over and sees Mary and he says, see mother, even now I am making all things new. And he's like bleeding. And, you know, it's like a little riff on, on, mm. on the Eastern narrative, but it's like, yeah, that's it. Like, yeah. even now he's making all things new. I'll, yeah. I'll just file that underway in my filing cabinet over here of, of things that aren't in the Bible, but definitely should be. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> exactly. I'll get some yeah. complaints for saying that, but you know what yeah. I mean? You know what I mean? It's a, it's a wonderful, uh, wonderful insight. Uh, yeah. It's yeah. a beautiful image. I think that's Christian art at its best, isn't it? Where you, you, mm. I mean, in, in my view, something like the passion where th- there's no seeking to contradict scripture, but th- there mm. is, there is this sense of, yes, we have the Bible. Yes, we have the story, but you know, any film you, you have to, you have to write more words than are in the Bible when it comes to quoting Jesus. You need to, yeah. the artistic license has to come into play. And I think the way the artistic license came into play in a film like that it was plausible, wasn't it? I think that's the word I'm looking for. It was plausible. Definitely. Yeah, Jesus kind of would say that at that point, wouldn't he? Definitely. And I think, you know, you know, the uh, the, the Lecto Divina practice, um, I don't know if you've, you, if you've done that, but it, it, the simple meditation upon the scripture, allowing yourself to kind of, an incarnational response to the scripture. So imagining that, that you're Peter on the boat, stepping out, what does the water feel like? Bringing yourself into the story. You can't do that without, getting a more kind of colorful image of what might have been going on and um you know th- th- we're told that the, that, the, that the word is living that it's living and you know it's active it's sharper than a double-edged sword so i love that bro that you can take it you can take a you can take something and, and think what else would have been going on in there you're not yeah you're not republishing it but you're just like you, you, it's becoming richer and clearer yes what do you think jesus overall message was <sighs> everything you hope to be true is (laughs) not your superficial materialistic worldly longings but the 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 cry of your soul everything that your soul hopes to be true actually is you are loved you do belong the story isn't over um yeah and 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 he proves it (laughs) how how do you marry that with um Jesus saying things like, you know, in this world, you will have trouble and, and all the stuff that sorts of, you know, suggests that followers of Jesus are going to have it really hard. Yeah, um, you're right. And, I, you know, I think I think back to Pakistan a lot, bro. When I, whenever I think about the gospel, I'm like, well, this this is got to be the same gospel for me as it is for the guys that we grew up around. And I think ultimately the kingdom 
following the way the kingdom reveals this eternal longing in us. And that's the one thing I can't ever get around. You know, it's like we were made for eternity and eternity is now and it's begun. And so ultimately, when I share the message that I believe Jesus brought, I am confronting myself and others with the fact that there is an eternal homesick within us all and that's where to stop that's where it starts to get really fun you know because you're right you know it doesn't make sense if if it's all just here and now because it's it sucks it's terrible how many people have we lost this year just to this new flu that's come about you know yeah. um but no there's an eternal homesickness within us and and the message of jesus gives space to that and validates it yeah absolutely so so in thinking ahead and big picture thinking yeah there is there is an end to all this and all things will be made right again mm. do, do you think there is a challenge in in jesus and in the scriptures to say look it's not guaranteed that you will enjoy paradise and eternity but actually there's something you have to believe or something you have to do or things you need to take to heart now it's not guaranteed that when you die everything will be perfect mm. what, what would you say to that my uh going back to the going back to what you're saying about you know the artistic expression of the scriptures my best answer to that is read the great divorce yes <laughs> like, lewis yeah read read the great divorce I, I think that's that is honestly like yeah um i think what i've learned about the message of jesus if i read the beatitudes um i'm doing a series on my podcast at the moment about the beatitudes and it's changed my life because what it, what is what is revealed to me is jesus is preparing us to live in his kingdom forever mm. and whether you've said a prayer of sorts or whether you've done various duties whether you live in line with the beatitudes or not defines how prepared you are for this kingdom that's forever and i um i think i i think what c.s lewis does in that book is he reveal he he breaks the psyche of like what do I need to do to like, like the rich man? Like, what do I need to do to inherit the kingdom? Everything, you know, it, it's the, it's the before the good Samaritan. What do I need to do to inherit the kingdom? Love your neighbor. Now, when have you ever heard that preached in context of like the salvation message? Love, you know, do what it says, do the golden rule, love your neighbor as you love yourself. Oh, oh, okay. And how does he amplify that with the story of the good Samaritan? Because being the good Samaritan is preparing to be ready for this kingdom that lasts forever. Mm -hmm. So, that's my simplistic answer is I, I believe that the, the time that we spend here before that veil, before we die, is in preparation to live in forever in a kingdom. And I do believe that you can live in such a way that doesn't prepare you for it. And um, I think C.S. Lewis answers it far more, more masterfully than I ever could. So <laughs> if you're listening to this, you're like, what are you talking about, Josh? <laughs> Just go. Just, just read the great divorce. <laughs> <laughs> it's on my reading list. I'll try and yeah. bump it up towards the top of the pile <laughs> of the fifty or so on it. Very good. You know, in fact, when I when I read Love Wins, I was like, oh, okay, all right. I, I see where you got this from. <laughs> <laughs> it's been done before. Okay, it's been done right. before. I, I look at I look at all that you're in, involved in, all the the music and the podcasting and the community, and and it, it's all great stuff. But I, I often find myself wondering financially how mm. is this how is this stuff viable you know it, you and i know it's not cheap to make an album uh, no. you and i know there's there's not really i mean if if you if, if there is mu if there is money in podcasting we need to have a conversation after this but as, far, <laughs> as far as i know you know what you're talking about the beatitudes like wonderful great stuff but again is that doesn't pay the bills does it so how do you how do you kind of keep a roof over your head and support your family because yeah. at least from an outsider looking in it looks like this is all great stuff but um, I, I don't see how this could pay the bills. No, it's, it's a really good question. So it begins with, it begins with like recognizing I have a job and I have work and sometimes they're the same thing, but other times they're not. So the work of Joshua Luke Smith is to be a poet. That's my work in the same way a carpenter has, has work. Like that's my work. Sometimes it's my job in the sense that sometimes it pays the bills, but it's my work in the way that Adam was commissioned to work and care for the earth. So, that's that's how I live my life and my my job my job at different times looks like different things so I prioritize my life around my work and my job fits into that and so at the moment my job might look like doing some design work for someone my job might look like doing some consultancy I do I do I do quite a lot of what what people call consultancy I call it just blagging <laughs> where, where, where I'll, I'll get to go into organizations and work with individuals and talk about to talk about a creative process and talk about ways to express yourself and export what you have in you. Um, but at the same time, Sam, it does, it, 
I'm grateful that the work I do as a poet on my podcast actually does bring bring financing in, in diverse ways. I have a, I actually have a subscription called the Pilgrimage Co. And you know, I just say on my podcast, look, this will never adverts on have ever have adverts on here. This is a this is a podcast for the people and from the people. And uh, if they if you pledge to that, it's a monthly subscription. You know, there's different things that you get, and um, yeah, I'm an independent artist, so I keep yeah. my Spotify streams. So when they're good, it pays some money, and uh, I get to work with different individuals and help you know spread their message through writing poems and stuff. Yeah. So I'm constantly just doing whatever I need to do yeah, to keep yeah. my work the priority. Um, and do you know what? That is a decision that I've made with my wife, um, and it's not for everyone. Uh, you know, and then the moments come, like I got a song this year. Um, I'll, I'll tell you this, in one day I found out that I was losing X amount of money and it was a significant amount of money because every tour and every festival was canceled. The next week I found out that a song had been synced with T-Mobile for their advert across the US. And it brought in more money in that one day than the whole year would have done in the tours. Wow. So you live in this kind of like, that could happen, it's yeah. never guaranteed, but it could. Um, which is which is super helpful. Well, so I, hey, think, I, I yeah. think that's really massively encouraging for those other independent artists out there to know, hey, it, it is possible. Because I think a yeah. lot of the time you, you speak to people and certainly the impression I've had, even asking you that question, the impression I've had for a long time is, you know, if you're an independent, independent artist, certainly if you're a Christian independent artist, and I know a lot of your work goes beyond the walls of the church, but you know what I mean? Mm. If you're, certainly yeah, if you're sure. working, working within the church, for sure, and some of those festivals and stuff, the, 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 the feedback I've had from a lot of people is basically no chance uh your, your best chance is move to america and try it there because there's a bigger market yeah. you know that's that's kind of been the perception isn't it yeah, yeah no uh, for sure and there's something that comes with it where i you know the the work of an artist isn't to be cut is to be is, is the work of a servant you know and that's something that i actually feel really i think that might be something that i'm more dedicate myself to in my 30s in terms of the way i talk to and mentor other artists is, is we're servants you know like and so we're here to help society. And that doesn't mean that we get paid. Um, it doesn't devalue our art. But if you look at the tradition of the poet, there's a great book. Uh, do I, no, it's downstairs. There's a great book called Against Creativity. And it's, it's written by a really interesting man. But the whole concept of the book is, look, you, the arts weren't initially there for people to get rich and famous. They were there to help people understand the human condition. And yes, sometimes you get paid for it. But if what you're doing is to get paid then do something different, man. Yeah. Like just, just enjoy your work. Enjoy yeah. your, the Hebrew word is adovar. You might, you know, if you've read John Mark Comer's Garden City, yeah. he digs into that, you know, work and worship, the same thing. Like I'm not devaluing the arts. Like I'll, you want me to write you a poem? I'll, I'll put a paycheck to that. But that isn't the primary focus or the fruit of my work. Mm. So that's been so helpful. I'm here to serve you, Sam. Like I'm here to serve my listeners. I'm a servant to them. And um, and sometimes I get paid for that. Yeah. Sometimes like, I don't. You're you're doing an awesome job of breaking down all sorts of uh, preconceptions I've I've had that have, that have been false <laughs> already. I feel like you might have broken down another one, and that is earlier in this interview you spoke about being dyslexic, and mm. ever since then you've been quoting amazing Christian books left, right, and center. <laughs> so clearly your dyslexia has not held you back from from reading. No, uh, no. It, it, again, later in my teens, I just reading was just associated with this kind of academic difficult pursuit and I just I don't know man something clicked where mm. I was like this is pleasurable this is yeah. really pleasurable and guess what I can read at my own pace I don't have to read 10 books a month I can read slowly and uh, I know you're a reader Sam like and but that's and so interesting because all... I had a very similar experience I mean I'm not dyslexic but I for a long time, certainly at school and college, reading was a thing you had to do. And you were yeah, these totally. books and you had to read these books. And I, I did struggle. And what that did was that basically meant I did not read for pleasure for years because mm. I'd associated reading with being forced to read these certain books at school. Right. And then I'd right. say really like, I mean, even if I'm being really honest, I actually think post-university, it wasn't until after. So I'm talking right. about, I'd say maybe mid twenties. Yeah. So only yeah. in the last, yeah. only in the last few years, really, I've yeah. started to yeah. kind of, play catch up and like go back yeah. to this book and this book and this book yes yes so there's definitely something i mean maybe this is something about the uk's education system that no for that sure you and i yeah. were put off reading by the education yeah system. but it's also like music it's like saying you know I th th this isn't this analogy breaks down but like saying you grew up listening to jazz and you were told that's what music is it's jazz and you're like i just really struggle with it i don't understand it 
And then you find this like niche alternative K-pop, funk, death metal, hip hop uh, mix. And you're yeah. like, oh, I can listen to that all day. Yeah. And it's similar with reading. It's like, fine, you know, you find, I, I love two types of books. I like, I like wild narrative that moves into like, fantasy I, lo I love Tolkien and I love Lewis like I just love those guys um I love that because it's just so beyond realism but it's so dense with truth and then I love non-fiction I, I, I really love books on the spiritual path I just I love that so that's my thing but if you try and get me to read another novel or a book about like like self-help stuff just doesn't click you know mm. like it just I don't get it so I think it's kind of similar. It's like read. I remember here, I don't know who said this, but someone was like, I've never met someone who writes well, who doesn't read a lot. And that just, I was like, oh, snap. Okay, well, I want to write. I better start reading, you know? And uh, and it's just become a joy. I've heard exactly the same thing before. The best writers yeah. are readers. So that's yeah, true. that's it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, um, what's been the best day of your career and what's been the worst? Oh, make a question. Oh, snap. Oh man, do you know what? I, I was just talking about this yesterday. I did a trip to India like four years ago and I was going out there knowing I was going to do, do some shows and some like really kind of well-established events, venues. And on the first, bro, the first day I land and this guy picks me up, this guy who's going to host me for the week. And he goes, we're, we're, the first place we're going to go to is um, outside of the city you're staying in. There's a leprosy colony. And he's like, I'm dropping off some rice. And I was like, okay, do you want me to stay in the car? And he was like, no, no, I want you to come and share some poems. <laughs> <laughs> and I did. And I was like, all right, man, this is this is what I'm made for. Like, this is it. Uh, it was very, very special. And that that stayed with me forever. I've got I've got the pictures, some pictures of that moment like printed out of like, wow. I got to share poems with people on the other side of the world who were living with a condition that alienates me like i can't even fathom living with that condition and the words in some crazy way meant something to them it's like i'm gonna no one can stop me writing now you know um worst day worst day was 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 being on a pretty big tour and <sighs> expecting to feel something that i didn't the whole mm -hmm. time basically expecting to feel this like measure of fulfillment that I didn't and and like more thinking about the Instagram post that I was going to do about the tour than being in it and realizing wherever like not being present has the same effect everywhere you are you know and I was like dang you know what I missed it and it wasn't because it wasn't a good tour it was I wasn't I was there but I wasn't there mm. um and that was devastating man that was like oh snap like what if that moment doesn't come again what if that crowd is never that big again um, and I just really wasn't in it. Um, so I learned, I learned a lot on that tour. <laughs> One subject I'd love to cover, time is running away from us, but um, you've put out some work recently around issues of race, racism. Mm. And um, I'd just love to hear a bit more about your, your journey with that. I mean, obviously you're in an interracial marriage. So I imagine mm. these conversations have, have happened between you and your wife probably for a long time. But I'm aware that just in, in the general societal consciousness, this conversation has gone up at least a few notches since particularly yes. the death of, of George Floyd. And I always have to put a caveat to that, which I think is quite important, is that I I have seen the conversation go up a few notches, but that is because I am white and moving mm. for one of a better term white majority spaces if i weren't white if i were black i'd probably be saying these conversations have been happening forever it's probably. just that arguably society at large is i don't know what the right term would be catching up or becoming more aware mm. of these things so yeah i'd just love to hear about your own personal story with with that huge topic let's open that for one sure up. yeah, yeah. I, I i didn't mean to do this but i'm, I'm wearing my check your blind spot t-shirt right now there you go put check it on your this blind spot. okay and, and that this is a phrase that um I came up with, for, I didn't come up with a phrase obviously, but it came up with for myself as like a, as a sort of magnetic north in my conversations and my process with, with racism. And it was basically around this, um, the whole idea of if I reverse my car and I don't check my blind spot, if I hit someone, it's not their fault, it's mine. And I just was like, okay, that's, that's how I'm approaching this conversation around racism as a white man is my ignorance or my des my desire to look the other way 
is 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 hurting people and yeah like my wife is black and you know my, my father-in-law is black and i have been involved in these conversations for a long time because i've i've been a i've, I've received the benefits of black culture and black art um i've been made aware of things because i've done the wrong thing um i've done hurtful things and so this year the, i put out a poem called Check Your Blind Spot this year, which is really the kind of expression of the last five years for me, which was, I've got to read, I've got to learn, I've got to ask questions. And, and the benefit, a good thing of 2020 is a lot of people have been doing that. The sad thing of 2020 is that it can become like any other thing that's a trend or a fad. You do, the, yeah. you read the book and then you stop. Um, and so that's why I'm really just here to point people towards the work of those that are on the front line doing, you know, you know the, 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 the day in, day out work that I think is so admirable. Um, the- there'll, be, there'll be people listening to this, and I have to confess I would have been in this category myself not that long ago. There'll be people listening to this who just, who just think, you just frankly don't, don't really get it and just think, mm. what exactly is the problem here? And, and the attitude from, from some white people, again, I put myself in this category, to be honest with you, certainly a few, few years ago, even a few months ago, it's this perception of, well, hang on, we, we've got equality in our laws. And, and, and often you'll hear the phrase as well, and I don't, I don't see colour. And, you know, mm. I love black people. And what's, what's the problem here? And I think there's also a perception among some Christians in the UK that what happened to George Ford, of course, was horrific. But, but that, mm. is, that is a police force in another country. Mm-hmm. I know there's a lot in there to respond to, but I'm just aware that's how some people are coming to this conversation. And I'm sure you've heard yeah. other people say those sorts of things. What, what, what would be your encouragement or your response to that kind of an attitude? For sure. I, but my first thing is, like, I get it. And, and me too. Like, I was definitely in that, in that mindset as well. Um, I think you're right. Let's make it specific. Let's make it about being British. And the, 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 the turning point for me, Sam, was realizing that I didn't have a grasp at all upon the black experience historically in England. And when you talk about, when one talks about the slave trade, who, who do I think of? Wilberforce. Yeah. So a white victor, a white hero in the story of slavery. Um, and so my encouragement to anyone, I've had lots of conversations based around that, that same stance or mindset is, okay, let's just begin not making this about race, although it inherently is, let's make it about history. You know, let's learn our history because how is that? How could that not be a good thing? You know, and so reading, reading history, you know, just from the 17th century, 18th century up until now, where you'll learn why, why are there black people in England? You know, and once you once you dive into that question and you realize that that the black experience in the UK is hemmed in with systemic racism and abuse and trauma and then to realize, oh, snap. So. The person I'm reading about historically is actually the grandfather of the person that I work with. Then that changes. Oh, this isn't 500 years ago. This is now. Yeah. So, so I think Ben Lindsay said this. Um, if you have you a bad day, do you think about your day as it was a bad day? Did it have anything to do with the color of my skin? I have never thought that in my life. Sure. You know, but for someone of color, that is there, you know, was it because of someone, something someone said, was it because of a system that I'm in that ultimately I have to confront every day? And so with humility, I would just encourage people to read books that tell us about our history. I, mm-hmm. I really, really enjoyed and been challenged by Rennie Edelodge's book. I know, I know the title's provocative, you know, why I'm no longer talking about race to white people. The, the title's meant to be provocative, you know. I've had a couple of like, I'm not reading a book, Scott, it's, it's a provocative title. Well, it got your attention, you know, like <laughs> read the read the book. Cause because her chapter on history is just so good. It's so enlightening. Just learning about, you know, stop the American narrative. Let's just talk about the British narrative. Ben Lindsay's book um is so, so good, especially if you're especially if you're in a white majority church in the UK. We need to talk about race is is phenomenal. Um, me and white supremacy is another great book so just begin with reading i think that's a really simple place to start Uh, it's often a question of you don't you don't know what you don't know and um it's interesting you talk about how you know you and i've never had that experience um of uh, well i I certainly never never had an experience of racism against me and and you start to sort of play that one through i mean the other the other example is i think back to when black panther was released and how Mm. you know 
pretty much all, all of my friends who don't look like me were just like, this is so exciting. This is such an amazing film. And it, again, it yeah. took me a while, but I was like, oh, hang on. Yeah. Hang on a minute. Every superhero film I've ever right. seen is right. someone who looks like me. Right. What if, what if I were black? And what if every single time I ever saw a superhero, they were white? Like that, that would do something to you. And so, of course, it makes total sense that when a superhero film full of black people is released, if you're black, you think, wow, finally, someone's seen me. And it, it's in some ways, it's not that it's not that difficult to understand. I mean, in hindsight, right? I look back and I think, come on, Sam, that was obvious. But at the time, mm. it wasn't obvious. And it, it mm-hmm. took a few things to, to make these mm-hmm. connections, doesn't mm-hmm. it? It's just, so it takes true. a few things like that and you just start yeah. to see things in a different way. It's so true. I don't know if you if you if you've seen Sainsbury's brought out a Christmas advert this week and it just features a black family. And there has been a, an outpouring of responses. I mean, an outpouring of responses from white people about how disgusted they are by it. And it's 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 eye opening, Sam, to read these comments and say, well, this, you know, this is this is now this is this yeah. is here. This is now. And, you know, effectively people feeling not represented in the advert. And um, something that that I think of, uh, a phrase that's come out of 2020 is this, if you feel exhausted by doing the work of anti-racism, just imagine how exhausting it has been to live with racism, you know? So if you feel offended because for the first time in your life, you've seen an advert that doesn't represent you, just put yourself in the shoes of anyone yeah. of color, you know, yeah. a, who's living in, in this country. So it's, it's humbling. It's the, it's, it's the message of Jesus. It's Jesus turning the table. It's the inclusivity of Christ. You know, it's the good Samaritan. But this is the craziest thing when, when you're talking, especially to a follower of Jesus who, who is struggling to want to embrace the journey, at least the journey of investigation is, bro, it begins with Jesus. Jesus used specific words. You know, he said he evoked the image of a Samaritan. Why? Because there was an inherent racism between the Hebrews and the Samaritans. And it goes all the way back hundreds of years, you know. And so he evokes it because he knows what it's going to do in the heart. So it's a gospel issue at its heart. And and um, and it's one that we're... Yeah. One that we have, we have the opportunity to embrace. We have the choice to embrace it or not, which in itself is a privilege. The journey, at least, Absolutely. you know. Well, having covered all the big issues, and I've really, <laughs> I've really, really enjoyed this conversation. Let's too, end with a too. let's end with a nice, easy question. How would you describe okay. your calling? <laughs> <laughs> um, all right, two things. Um, I am curious. I, I'm I'm curious more than I have any certainty about my calling. I'm curious. I'm constantly asking a question: Where does this thing go? Right? Like, where does this take me? And and every day I'm living in where it's taking me. And so I know. So I'm going to mention what I said at the beginning. I'm a merchant of mystery. I'm just, I'm just, I'm seeing where this thing thing goes. How how do I find my calling? I'm I, I'm seeing where this thing goes. I'm I'm following the path of Jesus. I'm writing poems. I'm I'm trying to love people well. You know, I've realized that about calling is it's not it's not a vocation. It's 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 how you posture yourself, you know. Amazing. Well, yeah. <laughs> that's a, that is a wonderful and profound place to leave it. If you want to hear more from Joshua Luke Smith, go to joshualukesmith.com or all the usual places on social media. Joshua, thank you so much for chatting. It's been a real. Pleasure. Thank you, Sam. I appreciate you, bro. Thank you for the great questions. You have been listening to The Profile Podcast. Thanks so much for joining me for my conversation with Joshua Luke Smith. I really enjoyed it, as I'm sure you could tell in listening to that back. I hope you got a lot out of it as well. Here on The Profile Podcast, we like to interview Christians from all different walks of life and different backgrounds. And I love what Joshua shared there about his missionary parents growing up in Pakistan, some of the more contemporary issues around race as well, his own theological journey, uh, his poetry. I mean, there was so much there, and I hope it blessed you. This is actually the last interview that I'm going to be doing this year. I'm off on my Christmas holidays, but over the next couple of weeks, you will be hearing some fantastic interviews my colleagues here at Premiere are bringing to you. So look out for those. But I just wanted to say from me personally, thank you so much for listening to the Profile Podcast this year. I really hope these interviews have blessed you, challenged you, encouraged you in your walk of faith. And I look forward to bringing you lots more where that came from in 2021. We've already got some fantastic guests lined up. If you have enjoyed the show this year, we'd really appreciate it if you could give us a rating, a review, wherever you found this podcast. And also, would you consider sharing it with your friends or posting about us on social media? It will help other people discover the show. Thanks so much. We really appreciate all your support. I will see you in the new year here on the Profile Podcast. But over the next couple of weeks, you'll be hearing from some of my colleagues and they've got some great interviews for you. So don't go anywhere. A very, very Merry Christmas to you. God bless you. I will see you in the new year. Take care.